The first thing you need to know about Goldman Sachs is that it's everywhere. The world's most powerful investment bank is a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Any attempt to construct a narrative around the former Goldmanites in influential positions quickly becomes an absurd and pointless exercise, like trying to make a list of everything. What you need to know is the big picture. If America is circling the drain, Goldman Sachs has found a way to be that drain. An extremely unfortunate loophole in a system of Western democratic capitalism, which never foresaw that in a society governed passively by free markets and free elections, organized greed always defeats disorganized democracy. They achieve this using the same playbook over and over again. The formula is relatively simple. Goldman positions itself in the middle of a speculative bubble, selling investments they know are crap. Then they hoover up vast sums from the middle and lower floors of society, with the aid of a crippled and corrupt state that allows it to rewrite the rules in exchange for the relative pennies that the bank throws at political patronage. Finally, when it all goes bust, leaving millions of ordinary citizens broke and starving, they begin the entire process over again. Riding in to rescue us all by lending us back our own money at interest, selling themselves as men above greed. Just a bunch of really smart guys keeping the wheels greased. They've been pulling the same stunt over and over since the 1920s. And now they're preparing to do it again, creating what may be the biggest and most audacious bubble yet. The basic scam in the internet age is pretty easy, even for the financially illiterate to grasp. Companies that weren't much more than pot-fueled ideas scrawled on napkins by up-too-late bong smokers were taken public via IPOs, hyped in the media and sold to the public for mega-millions. It was as if banks like Goldman were wrapping ribbons around watermelons, tossing them out of 50-story windows and opening the phones for bids. In this game, you were only a winner if you took your money out before the melon hit the pavement. It sounds obvious now, but what the average investor didn't know at the time was that the banks had changed the rules of the game, making the deals look better than they actually were. They did this by setting up what was in reality a two-tiered investment system, one for the insiders who knew the real numbers, and another for the lay investor who was invited to chase soaring prices the banks themselves knew were irrational. While Goldman's later pattern would be to capitalize on changes in the regulatory environment, the key innovation in the internet years was to abandon its own industry standards of quality control. Goldman's role in the sweeping global disaster that was the housing bubble is not hard to trace. Here again, the basic track was a decline in underwriting standards, although in this case the standards weren't in IPOs, but in mortgages. By now, almost everyone knows that for decades, mortgage dealers insisted that home buyers be able to produce a down payment of 10% or more, show a steady income and good credit rating, and possess a real first and last name. Then at the dawn of the new millennium, they suddenly threw all that shit out the window and started writing mortgages on the backs of napkins to cocktail waitresses and ex-cons carrying five bucks in a Snickers bar. And what caused the huge spike in oil prices? Take a wild guess. Obviously, Goldman had help. There were other players in the physical commodities market. But the root cause had almost everything to do with the behavior of a few powerful actors determined to turn the once solid market into a speculative casino. Goldman did it by persuading pension funds and other large institutional investors to invest in oil futures, agreeing to buy oil at a certain price on a fixed date. The push transformed oil from a physical commodity, rigidly subject to supply and demand, into something to bet on, like a stock. Between 2003 and 2008, the amount of speculative money in the commodities grew from $13 billion to $317 billion an increase of 2,300 percent. By 2008, a barrel of oil was traded 27 times on average before it was actually delivered and consumed. The history of the recent financial crisis, which doubles as a history of rapid decline and fall of the suddenly swindled dry American empire, reads like a who's who of Goldman Sachs graduates. By now, most of us know the major players. As George Bush's last Treasury Secretary, former Goldman CEO Henry Paulson was the architect of the bailout, a suspiciously self-serving plan to funnel trillions of your dollars into the handfuls of his old friends on Wall Street. Robert Rubin, Bill Clinton's former Treasury Secretary, spent 26 years at Goldman before becoming chairman of Citigroup, which in turn got a 300 billion dollar taxpayer bailout from Paulson. Then there's John Thane, the asshole chief of Merrill Lynch who bought an $87,000 area rug for his office as his company was imploding. A former Goldman banker, Thane enjoyed a multi-billion dollar handout from Paulson, who used billions in taxpayer funds to help Bank of America rescue Thane's sorry company. And Robert Steele, the former Goldmanite head of Wachovia, scored himself and his fellow executives $225 million in golden parachute payments as his bank was self-destructing. There's Joshua Bolton, Bush's chief of staff during the bailout, and Ed Liddy, the former Goldman director whom Paulson put in charge of bailed out insurance giant AIG, which forked over $13 billion to Goldman after Liddy came on board. 
the heads of Canadian and Italian national banks are Goldman alums, as is the head of the World Bank, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, the last two heads of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which incidentally is now in charge of overseeing Goldman. But then, something happened. It's hard to say what it was exactly. It might have been the fact that Goldman's co-chairman in the early 90s, Robert Rubin, followed Bill Clinton to the White House, where he directed the National Economic Council and eventually became Treasury Secretary. Well, the American media fell in love with the storyline of a pair of baby boomers, 60-child Fleetwood Mac yuppies nesting in the White House. It also nursed an undisguised crush on Rubin, who was hyped as without a doubt the smartest person ever to walk the face of the earth, with Newton, Einstein, Mozart, and Kant running far behind. Rubin was the prototypical Goldman banker. He was probably born in a 4,000 thousand dollar suit, he had a face that seemed permanently frozen just short of an apology for being so much smarter than you, and he exuded a Spock-like emotional neutral exterior. The only human feeling you could imagine him experiencing was a nightmare about being forced to fly coach. It became almost a national cliche that whatever Rubin thought was best for the economy, a phenomenon that reached its apex in 1999 when Rubin appeared on the cover of Time with his treasury deputy Larry Summers and Fed Chief Alan Greenspan under the headline The Committee to Save the World, and what Rubin thought mostly was the American economy economy, in particular the financial markets, were over-regulated and needed to be set free. During his tenure at Treasury, the Clinton White House made a series of moves that would have drastic consequences for the global economy, beginning with Rubin's complete and total failure to regulate his old firm during its first mad dash for obscene short-term profits. After the oil bubble collapsed last fall, there was no new bubble to keep things humming. This time, the money seems to be really gone, like worldwide depression gone. So the financial safari has moved elsewhere, and the big game in the hunt has become the only remaining pool of dumb, unguarded capital left to feed upon. Taxpayer money. But wait, there's more. Here in the biggest bailout in history is where Goldman Sachs really started to flex its muscle. It began in September of last year when then Treasury Secretary Paulson made a momentous series of decisions. Although he had already engineered a rescue of Bear Stearns a few months before and helped bail out quasi-private lenders Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Paulson elected to let Lehman Brothers, one of Goldman's last real competitors, to collapse without intervention. Goldman's superhero status was left intact, says market analyst Eric Salzman, and an investment banking competitor, Lehman, goes away. The very next day, Paulson greenlighted a massive $85 billion bailout of AIG which promptly turned around and repaid $13 billion it owned to Goldman. Thanks to the rescue effort, the bank ended up getting paid in full for its bad bets. Immediately after the AIG bailout, Paulson announced his federal bailout for the financial industry, $700 billion plan called the Trouble Assets Relief Program, and put a heretofore unknown 35-year-old Goldman banker named Neil Kashkari in charge of administrating the funds. Hey, I don't think anyone questions, Mr. Kashkari, that you're working hard. Our question is who you're working for. In order to qualify for bailout monies, Goldman announced that it would convert from an investment bank to a bank holding company, a move that allows it not only to $10 billion in TARP funds, but to a whole galaxy of less conspicuous publicly backed funding, most notably lending from the discount window of the Federal Reserve. And thanks to an obscure law allowing the Fed to block most congressional audits, both the amounts and the receipts of the monies remain almost entirely secret. You cannot be serious! Converting a bank to a holding company has other benefits as well. Goldman's primary supervisor is now the New York Fed, whose chairman at the time of its announcement was Stephen Friedman, a former co-chairman of Goldman Sachs. Friedman was technically in violation of the Federal Reserve policy by remaining on the board of Goldman, even as he was supposedly regulating the bank. In order to rectify the problem, he applied for, and got, a conflict of interest waiver from the government. That was easy. Friedman was also supposed to divest himself of Goldman stock after Goldman became a bank holding company. But thanks to the waiver, he was allowed to go out and buy 52,000 additional shares in his old bank, leaving him $3 million richer. Friedman stepped down in May, but the man now in charge of supervising Goldman, New York Fed President William Dudley, is yet another former Goldmanite. The collective message of all of this? The AIG bailout, the swift approval for its bank holding conversion, the TARP funds, is that when it comes to Goldman Sachs, there isn't a free market at all. The government might let other players on the market die, but it simply will not allow Goldman to fail under any circumstances. Its edge in the market has suddenly become an open declaration of supreme privilege. Now it's more of an explicit advantage. Fast forward to today. Having seamlessly navigated the political minefield of the bailout era, Goldman is once again back to its old business, scouting out loopholes in a new government-created market with the aid of a new set of alumni occupying key government jobs. Gone are Hank Paulson and Neil Kashkari. In their place are Treasury Chief of Staff Mark Patterson and CFTC Chief Gary Gensler, both former Goldmanites. Gensler was the firm's co-head of finance. 
And instead of credit derivatives or oil futures or mortgage-backed CDOs, the new game in town, the next bubble, is in carbon credits. A booming trillion dollar market that barely even exists yet. But will if the Democratic Party that gave four and a half million dollars to the last election manages to push into existence a groundbreaking new commodities bubble, disguised as an environmental plan called cap and trade. The new carbon credit market is a virtual repeat of the commodities market casino that's been kind to Goldman except it has its own delicious new wrinkle. If the plan goes forward as expected, the rise in prices will be government mandated. Goldman won't even have to rig the game. It will be rigged in advance.